Because we know that's exciting. Oh, yeah. Are you like? Are you gonna do the ones that we know in a sense where it's like we got from the ATI? Are you gonna do this grain? Like one yeah, grain? Yeah, I have is... a question about that because there was stuff on our uh, little practice thingy that they sent over the summer uh -huh. that we have never done questions like that in our life. So like what? Like Not only that, but like typos. Mm -hmm. There was lots of typos. So, so how was the grain used? Like I can't even. Can we get to that later? Yes. yes. All right. <laughs> Special considerations. Women with HIV and AIDS, um, for the most part, they're normal postpartum people. Okay, they're normal pregnancy, normal delivery. We work very hard to keep their uh, viral load down, um, and uh, we. Uh, uh, um, uh, I want to say we deliver vaginally, um, and then. Can women who are HIV positive breastfeed in the United States? Is it recommended? No. No. How about in Africa? Yes. Yeah. Okay. It's a matter of your, your water level, your water safety. Where the water is safe, when they can mix formula safely without causing food poisoning, then they say by all means, you know, breastfeed or bottle feed. But if you're in a place where clean water is not a necessary guarantee, then we say, okay, you should probably breastfeed. The number one killer of children around the world before the age of five is contaminated water. And so if you, have, if you don't have access to clean water, then breastfeeding is definitely safer than bottle feeding. But uh, if the opposite is true, then the opposite is true. So in America and in most of the Western world, we don't currently recommend breastfeeding, although that will change in the next 10 or 15 years. Based on research or? Yeah. Because we know that the chance of getting HIV through breast milk is very, very low, especially because it's a PO drug. So the virus is entering the mouth and into the gut, being destroyed by the gut before it gets absorbed. Chance is very, very low that they're going to get it, especially if mom has a, a low viral load. But that'll come later. It's just like initially they said women with people with HIV weren't allowed to have sex ever again. Then they said, okay, you can have sex with a condom, and now they're like, ah, okay, just pull out. So, you know, the restrictions are getting more and more uh, relaxed yeah. as time goes. And so, you know, a typical over-response, and then it kind of swings back to normal. So it'll add back the other way. Post-op surgical patient. The most common surgeries are C-sections followed by tubal ligations. Um, then, and then, there, of course, there are like uh, different, like perineal lacerations are very much like surgeries as well. Um, and the important thing is um, wound care, making sure that their wound looks clean and dry and that they're okay, making sure that they're recovering from anesthesia well, and that they can breathe because of their anesthesia, right? So very few people get general anesthesia um, in, a, in the obstetric world. We use epidurals and spinals almost exclusively. Um, general anesthesia is reserved for emergency cases, like the splash of betadine while he scrubs and does a 40, that's a general anesthesia thing, okay? But if we have 15 or 20 minutes, we're gonna do a spinal or an epidural first. Uh, before we use general anesthesia. Um, so usually the recovery from C-sections um, and tubal ligations is not a big deal. They're wide awake throughout the surgery. Um, and so the recovery is not bad. But uh, when we do general, then all of the standard surgical precautions re uh, 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 apply. Um, with interesting thing, what, what we do these days if a woman is planning a tubal ligation is we leave the epidural in postpartum. We don't take it out. And then they just use it the next day when they do their c when they do their tubal. It's kind of a neat trick. Okay. Infant feeding choices is not really a choice at all. Um, uh, breastfeeding is the gold standard. We understand that. Everyone gets to, to make an educated decision about what they want to do. The vast majority of women who choose to formula feed do so because they have no idea what breastfeeding is. They don't even recognize that breastfeeding is a choice most of the time. And so the, uh, the word choice is a pretty tricky thing um, and when we're talking about the difference between breastfeeding and bottle feeding. Um, if, you, if every baby you've ever met was, breast, was bottle fed, if you've never seen a baby on the breast, if you go to the nursery store, if you go to the store and buy um, um, wrapping paper for, your, for your, 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 your baby gifts and they got bottles all over them, you write your postpartum cards and they say, what a beautiful baby, there's a bottle in it. You buy a baby survival kit, there's bottles in there. When there's bottles everywhere, they, it's hard to say that breastfeeding is normal, right? Because all you ever see are bottles. When I do a talk called the atrogenic breastfeeding complications, or no, um, swimming upstream, breastfeeding in a formula feeding world, and I walked through my hospital from the entrance to mother baby, and I took pictures of bottles everywhere I went, and I walked in, went to the, to the, the guest store, they had Christmas ornaments that were bottles, clinging, big balloons, mylar balloons, giant bottle, 
Ching, you know, <laughs> walked up on the mother baby floor to the, 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 the wall that talked about um, newborn photography. Bottles in the wrapper. Bing, you know, I walk into the, 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 the formula room. Obviously, lots of formula there. But the measuring tape we use to measure babies come from Infamil and Similac. Ching, you know, <laughs> they're everywhere. These, these advertisements in mother's magazines. And it's all over the place. So, you know, when you're constantly deluged with the idea of, of bottles are normal, bottles are, of course, everybody has to have a bottle, then it's hard to say that bottles are not normal, okay? But they're not. We know that bottle feeding is associated with a dramatic increase in both maternal and infant mortality and morbidity, and so we should never uh, encourage anybody to formula feed unless they have HIV, okay? Um, but the important thing is, um, is, is that when you're in the mother-baby floor, you cannot encourage someone to breastfeed who's a bottle feeder. It's too late. The decision to breastfeed or bottle feed is made either before they get pregnant or in the first part of the pregnancy 99% of the time. It is extremely rare to see a formula feeding woman switch to breastfeeding when her baby's born. Extremely rare. So you're wasting your time and you're being a little bit rude to tell a breastfeeding woman postpartum, you really need to be bottle feed, breastfeeding instead of bottle feeding. You're wasting your time. Don't even bother. Um, so you need to know, as a, mother, as, a woman who's take, as a nurse who's taking care of postpartum women, how to do both. Okay? Most lactation consultants market themselves as infant feeding experts. That we are the experts at breastfeeding, of course, but we're also the experts at bottle feeding as well. Um, and that's, uh, it's, a, a, it's just kind of our shtick, is how to nourish babies. Um, so I took out most of the slides. They're in there, you guys can keep them, but I've, I've hidden them because we've already talked a lot about them. Um, just know the basics. You guys understand breast structure, you understand what lactogenesis is, and you know what a milk ejection reflex is. Those are pretty darn important things to know. Okay? Formula feeding. If a woman is going to formula feed, you want to try to get her as close to normal as possible as, as you can. Okay? So breastfeeding is not just putting food in the baby's mouth. That's a big piece of it. But there's an awful large piece about bonding and skin-to-skin -skin contact and that kind of thing. So I say ba formula fed babies need to be held as much as breastfed babies. And they need to be held by the mother as much as breastfed babies. And they need to spend a lot of time skin to skin. They need to lick mom's skin and pick her bacteria up into their mouth. They need that stuff, okay? All the things that come along with the, the evolutionary aspects of breastfeeding, picking up the maternal microbiome and all that other stuff, all comes from that direct skin to skin contact that moms and babies get. Um, and when you're formula feeding, a baby's always wrapped up tight like a burrito, and across the other room in the Tupperware drawer, he cannot get all the stuff he needs from his mother. So they need to spend a lot of time skin to skin. The baby needs to be there. And so my formula feeding women, I ensure I make them put the baby in the chest as much as I can all the time. If the baby happens to take a breast, I don't care. But if she doesn't want him to, I tell her to wear a bra. But um, she needs to be skin to skin as much as possible. Baby needs to still be a mammal even if mom won't breastfeed it, okay? Um, and that's going to help her transition to motherhood, that's going to help her uh, bonding, with, bonding with her baby, and it's going to help her figure all that stuff out, okay? Um, uh, dad can also do skin to skin, but it's important to recognize that dad's nipples don't work, and my baby can't tell mom's nipples from dad's nipples, so if dad doesn't want the baby to latch onto his nipples, Dad needs to wear pasties or something to cover those nipples, okay? Because it's just not, it, 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 it doesn't feel the same for us as it does for you. When the baby, find, when the baby finds our nipples, it's like lightning. It's like, wow, what was that? You know, they're different. They're not connected that way. What is this feeling I have? Yeah, it, it doesn't get like that. And holy oh, no, cow, no, no, no. you drop the baby, throw him across the room. What was that? <laughs> it's just weird. Okay. <laughs> so tips for siblings, um, people always talk about, I don't know if I have enough love for two children or three children, which is pretty darn foolish, okay? Love is immeasurable and it grows exponentially. There's no such thing as I don't have enough, ch enough love for another child. There's plenty to go around, okay? Love isn't a finite resource that you dole out, here's 10 to you, and here's 10 to you, and I like you a little more, here's 11. You know, you don't do that, okay? It is immeasurable. There's always plenty, okay? Um, and uh, um, but what we do, what we find is that n other children, especially preschoolers, get very jealous of the baby, okay? Because that's my mommy. Who are you to come into my environment? That's my mommy. 
Okay, and so they find you find that toddlers and preschoolers will act up when mom is taking care of baby. That they, they, they break things or they drop things or they cry for no reason. You're like, why are you being such a pest? Because now you're looking at me and you're talking to me. Even negative in, in attention is better than no attention. And so I encourage uh, new parents to bring the sibling in to the baby care. This is a beautiful baby. Help me change the diaper. Aren't you great? And my kids will actually help my wife breastfeed. It's hilarious. They'll go, okay, baby, we'll touch your head. Is that better? He's got a good latch, mommy. You know, that kind of thing, because they hear me doing it, right? Because they model the parent's behavior. So they'll sit and help, and my, my, I've got a picture of every single one of my older children, or younger children, breastfeeding their, their, their doll, or their stuffed animal, or their, their rocket raccoon, whatever. They always seem to breastfeed the baby, right around three or four years old. So they like, what? This is what you do, you know? Um, uh, let's see here. So you're going to have to be lactation. I know, right? Well, what my son wants to be, a, I think he's going to be a midwife. Oh. Yeah, he talks about it from time to time. He's the one who took the test that you guys took. How'd he do? What? No better than you guys. <laughs> <laughs> That's rude. <laughs> no, you guys did better than he did. What can I say? So, um, the, uh, <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> So maternal self-assessment, mom needs to be paying attention to all these things that we've already done. We just need a teacher to do it. Sexual activity and contraception. Let's skip ahead a little bit because you know I love to talk about sex. So, because no one else will. That's the point. No one else will talk about it, so you've got to talk about it. The average breastfeeding woman returns to intercourse within 10 days postpartum. Okay, uh, That is a normal response. Uh, the average formula feeding woman, it's usually a little bit later, closer to six weeks. Um, the theory behind it being that surge of oxytocin, you know, is filling her with maternal I love you hormones, and it makes her return to, to normal activity a little bit sooner. Um, what I tell people is as soon as your wounds have healed, and your bleeding has stopped, and you feel like having sex, then by all means, go have sex. Okay? Understand, we all know that sex makes babies. They don't fall from the sky, and you know they're not because you love each other and you kiss. And they it's don't because come from somebody. Flu shots. What's that? Yeah, they don't come from flu shots. That's right. <laughs> but somebody stuck a penis in somebody else, left a lot, left some semen behind, and that's how we got pregnant, right? And so anytime you do that, you have to think about: Do I want to get pregnant again? Yes or no? And if the answer is no, you need to be doing something about it. Okay. And so when women say, "I want to get pregnant again in a year," I say, then just plain old breastfeed. You'll get pregnant on 14 months postpartum like everyone else and have a baby. But they say, I don't want to get pregnant for five or six years. Then we need to talk about what we're going to do to make it different. So it's important to be able to have that talk to women because they're going to ask, when can I have sex again? When would it be okay? What if I get pregnant again? How do I do that? And so you need to be able to talk to your families about that. <clears throat> um, I have an awful lot of dads ask me, when can we have sex again? Right. And I'm like, well, whenever she says so. Yeah. <laughs> You'd be surprised when I was working at LBGYN, how many people came in pregnant and like, what? How did that happen? How did that happen? Well, he wanted to. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I mean, a lot of it, it's, it's part of the negotiation of marriage. I get it, you know, but. They come in and yeah, they're yeah. six week appointment, four weeks pregnant. Yeah. yeah, well, that's your formula for your mom is there. <laughs> Anyway, special needs populations, adolescent mothers are stuck in a crisis, right? They are both trying to become adults and trying to become mothers at the same time. We're going to talk about that, I think, a little bit more when we talk about uh, pediatric development. Mm -hmm. But adolescent mothers struggle with that dual role, okay? They want to go through, they want to finish high school and hang out with their friends and do all that stuff, but they also have a baby that they need to take care of. And so it's a, um, it's a difficult adjustment for them. The other thing I think is really difficult with adolescents is adolescent dads. I never know what to do with them, okay? Because I talk about them like dads, right? And I talk about, you know, helping with breastfeeding and all that good stuff. And then I realize well, he probably doesn't live with her. I know if my daughter got pregnant, the boy wouldn't be living, let alone <laughs> living with us, okay? They certainly wouldn't be sleeping in the same room, so he'd help her breastfeed at 3 o'clock in the morning. I don't see that happening. So there's, there's a real barrier there for adolescent, adolescent parents, both from the mom's perspective and from the dad's perspective. So you just need to kind of feel it out. What are the plans when you guys go home? Where do you live? Where are you going to live? Are you going back to school? Who's taking care of the baby when you go back to school? How does that work? I found an interesting article recently um, out of the, the UK, um, and it talked about uh, the level of social support 
that a young mother gets is inversely proportional to the, her success in breastfeeding which is kind of odd because it's different from everyone else, but it says the more grandma or dad takes care of the baby, the less mom will breastfeed, okay? Because she's not with the baby anymore. Because she's not, the, she's not present. Someone else is taking care of the baby. Someone else is bottle feeding the baby while she's away doing something else. And I thought, well, that's, I've got to delve into that a little bit more because my initial response was, oh, that's stupid. And I thought, well, let's read that a little bit more, okay? Women placing their babies up for adoption. This is a big one. Okay, the phrase we use is BUFA, baby up for adoption, B-U-F-A. And you'll see BUFA written on charts <coughs> from time to time. That's an interesting problem, right? Because um, mom and baby are almost always separated almost immediately after birth, okay? We usually have the adoptive parents in the hospital. And the question is, does the hospital let them stay as patients? Do they use it as a hotel room? What do they do? Uh, my first, my second week, I guess, um Mm -hmm. One of my patients was, um, the mom was giving the baby for adoption, mm -hmm. and the, the adoptive parents were there, and they had this, like, tiny, tiny, tiny room, like, smaller than the old tiny conference room that we like to study in back mm -hmm. near the lab, but smaller wow. than that, that in the nursery, that they would allow moms to, like, go and breastfeed their kids in that room, or, like, visit with their child, not in their actual patient room, if that makes right. sense. And that's where they had the yeah. adoptive parents. And she literally stayed there from before I got there. Yeah. She went home for like an hour and showered and came back. And she sat in that room the entire time mm -hmm. with the baby and the adoptive mom just didn't. I never saw the adopt, like the biological mom with the um, right. like kid at all. And the, we use that, that, that style room an awful lot. Um, because we need to ensure that this family who's taking this baby home are prepared to take care of this baby. Right. That they know how to change a diaper, that they know all the things that we have to teach our postpartum moms, right? And so we use those rooms to, to, to kind of monitor their infant care and how, to, how they're doing and how they're adjusting to being parents. It's a wonderful thing. We use that room also for like when babies are born very prematurely and 12 weeks later they're going to go home. Moms, will, moms and dads will usually stay with the baby for a day or two there, right before discharge. Again, so the nursing staff can assess their readiness for parenting and say, make sure that they've got all the little things that they need to know. So that's important. So mom who's given the baby up for adoption needs a lot of support. She needs to be told about you're doing a brave thing, and I recognize why you're doing this, and I totally support you. And the parents who are taking the baby need to be trained on how to take care of babies, right? And older mothers. Older mothers are an interesting group of well, folks because they're mature already. They're already set in their ways. They already know what they're going to do. They're not interested in changing their lives very much. And so they tend to be a little bit different. They're the ones who are not likely to quit smoking for pregnancy. They're the ones who are not likely to make a lot of changes uh, to adapt to pregnancy. Um, and Because they're kind of set in their ways. And, and so I, I find the women who are nearing 40 or over 40, they, there's not a lot of education you could do. You talk to them until you're blue in the face. Most of the time they're going to ignore you. And what's important is just to recognize you still want to give them the information. You know, you don't want to just ignore them. But understand that they're not going to be eager and bright and, yay, teach me all you can teach me. They're not that people anymore. They've matured. They've already had other things go on. So they've got life experiences. So they're not as malleable as the 21-year-old first-time mom. The 44-year-old first-time mom, they kind of already know what they're talking about. Okay? Community resources, support groups like La Leche League and, um, and other uh, groups that take care of women. Um, like on the, in the, on the Army side, we have the, the New Parent Support Program and Army Community Service and those kind of things. Those similar organizations exist in the outside world. You know, like the WIC has uh, an awful lot of support. Um, and then there are visiting home nurses that come um, for, like I believe it's for the Medicaid population, that they go to their homes and do their home assessments. We need to know, as a mother-baby nurse, what your community resources are. Okay. A little bit of complication. I skipped over postpartum hemorrhage. I assume you know enough about that already. Hematomas. Um, a hematoma, we've mentioned it briefly on the postpartum hemorrhage thing. It's a blood vessel breaking in the pelvic wall somewhere. Tends to form a nice little uh, bruise that starts off very, very painful. And remember I talked earlier about women who, get, uh, who, who are postpartum, they need Motrin and Tylenol. Mm -hmm. And anyone who needs a narcotic postpartum, before I give it to them, I need to assess that they don't have a hematoma. Because okay? this is the most common source of needing uh, postpartum narcotics is they've got some kind of a, of a, something wrong in their pelvis that we need to kind of assess. Um, um, 
If you ever see anything about incision and drainage of a pelvic hematoma, the answer is no. <laughs> we do not IND pelvic hematomas unless they're causing mom to be vascularly unstable. They have to be really, really sick. Because what's going to happen is they're going to bleed into the tissue and eventually they'll build enough pressure that it'll tamponade the bleed and stop. Okay? Just like if you get a bruise on your skin, it bleeds until enough pressure builds up to stop bleeding and then it goes away. Like you see people like they get punched and they get this huge swelling. Okay? If you cut that open, would they not bleed like crazy? Mm -hmm. Same thing in the pelvis. All right? The big swelling builds up, you just put some ice on it, hold pressure, it'll settle down for a little bit and then it'll be okay. It's exactly the same in the pelvis. You just ice it and leave it alone. It's usually fine. Ice. Yes. How it happens? And sometimes it's, a, it's a, where there's a laceration. The vessel, vessel breaks from the laceration and then retracts into the tissue. And now it's going to bleed into the tissue and we can't get a hold of it. We can't see it. Okay, and it just kind of accumulates over time. Sometimes it's just the, the, the pelvis is intact and the blood vessel just breaks. But they cause, when you see hematomas, what's important to notice is 48 hours after the hematoma, there's going to be some very impressive bru bruising, okay? Because you start with this hematoma that's like half the size of my fist, and then the body starts to break it down and it spreads it out through the tissue. And I've seen bruises run down both sides of the thigh, and I tell mom, this is, you know, this is bad now and it's painful, we're going to treat it, you're going to be okay in two or three days when you see a huge bruise all over here, don't call me. <laughs> it's going to be impressive bru bruising and I'm sorry. But that impressive bruising is a normal healing response. And so it's important, it's careful assessment, watching to make sure that they're hemodynamically stable and they don't look like they're hemorrhaging, because they could hemorrhage and not notice, right? It bleeds into the tissue. Do you um, and then pain relief, the narcotics and that kind of thing. No, no, no. Do so, you measure it? To, no. You just, no. I, I take a look at it and I, I document it. It's about a two by three centimeter hematoma. Okay. Okay. And then the next shift will come on and say it's a six centimeter hematoma. Well, gosh. 12 hours later and it's bigger than it was, it's not tamponading, okay? And we need to see what's going on. Maybe we need to intervene. But we try not to. We try to leave it alone unless it's causing some real problems. Okay. Because opening it up is going to cause a, a huge can of worms. Oh, no. Yeah. Just, you know, and then um, there was something else that was important about hematomas. Just a second ago. I had it and I lost it. Oh, well. Sorry. It'll come back. It was either a lie or not important. You were talking about the bruising. Uh-huh. You said 48 hours after the hematoma is... Yeah, there'll be there'll be some impressive bruising, and that's very very normal. Yeah, I'm trying to help. Yeah, I know. <laughs> oh well, that's what I was going to tell you a story. Thanks. <laughs> so I had a woman that I was laboring one day, and she uh, she ended up going to C-section, and it was you know not a big deal. For everything it was fairly uncomplicated. It was great, and I saw her on mother baby, and she was just kind of weak and pale and. You know, not, not turning the corner. And so 48 hours later, you know, where she's still not turning the corner. We, we checked her out. She was, her hematocrit was really low, but there was no source of blood anywhere. So, you know, we worked her up completely nothing. Gave her a blood transfusion, kept her for another 48 hours. She was okay, but not great. Gave her another blood transfusion. Did a pelvic CT. It was normal. Sent her home, okay? She came back to the emergency room like a week later, pale, bleeding, hemo, hemo, hemoglobin dropping. Gave her another blood transfusion. She ended up being admitted and transfused four times. And then finally, right about a month and a half postpartum, um, we, did a, we, we, we looked again and finally they found a little source. They had nicked her iliac artery and it was bleeding into her thigh. And so wow. when, they did the, when they did in here, they couldn't find anything. The blood was tracking in her thigh muscles. And um, so she was bleeding into her pelvis, basically. And it took us six weeks to find it. Not for lack of trying. We were looking everywhere. We knew she was bleeding somewhere. We even took her back to the operating room and opened her up. We even took her back to the operating room and did a hysterectomy. And she still kept bleeding. We couldn't figure out where it was. It was way down in there, just a little, just enough that every week or so she'd bleed enough to need another cord. And <laughs> very, very tricky. Lucky, most of those are going to be pretty dramatic. Did she need it? Well, they couldn't find the source of the bleeding. They went all over everywhere and couldn't find the source of the bleeding. So it lasted, it lasted Jeffrey, you take everything out. She was done having children anyway. It was part of the plan. If we can't figure it out, maybe we'll hysterectomy and see if that makes yeah. it better. Okay, I'm all right with that. You know, that kind of thing. It wasn't like, um, like someone like Rowena who had the, uh, the traumatic hysterectomy. Uh, it wasn't like that. It was a planned thing as, well, I can't find a source no matter where I look, and I can't give you a blood transfusion every week for the rest of your life. So... 
we did. So it was a slow bleed. Yeah, it was a very slow bleed. Yep. Wow. Pulmonary embolism. Now, pulmonary embolism can can come from a DVT or it can be totally on its own. The idea is that a DVT doesn't move to the lungs. It's whatever caused the DVT could also cause a clot in the heart, the lungs, the brain, whatever. And so pulmonary embolism, you will see with DVTs or without, it's just wherever the clot happens to land. Now, the important thing about a DVT is they're an acute onset problem, all right? Everything is fine and life is happy and a blood clot lodges in the lungs and all of a sudden PE happens and now that lung is screaming for attention, okay? It is a very acute onset. They're fine and all of a sudden like, I can't, I can't. I can't breathe, I can't, I can't get air. And their pulse ox is dropping and they can't breathe for no reason out of the clear blue sky, okay? That's what a pulmonary embolism looks like, okay? It's acute onset dyspnea, uh, diaphoresis, anxiety leading to syncope, okay? If you ever get to see a pulmonary embolism, it is obvious. It's like a panic attack on steroids, all right? Now, people who have panic attacks, they get the dyspnea, they, get the, they, get the, they can even get chest pain and diaphoresis, but their pulse ox stays stable the whole time because they're not actually having trouble moving air. All right? A PE, they look like they're having a panic attack and their pulse ox is like 80, and that's why you know there's something desperately wrong. We usually work up just about all panic attacks as PEs to rule out just in case, but it's a pretty low suspicion if their pulse ox is staying good. Okay. But with people who have a PE, you know, we want to do our ABCs. The limiting visitors, I don't understand that at all because we are freaking out <laughs> with a PE. That's like, you know, part of listing is part of a full arrest. You know, while you're doing CPR, limit your visitors. Yes. You know, you've got, an, you've got an extensive response to a PE. But what's going to happen is we're going to, we're going to, we're going to, um, we're going to, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm blanking. We're going to give her a heparin. A lot of heparin. We can't treat the PE, right? All we can do is support her with her ABCs until uh, PE resolves. Okay? I, I suppose if it got really bad, interventional radiology could come and take the blood clot out. But uh, generally speaking, we're going to manage her ABCs until we can get her stable. Peripheral infections. Um, there's an awful lot of places we can get an infection postpartum. The uterus is the most common. Uh, placenta, I mean the, um, the labial lacerations are less common. Episiotomy is very common source of infection. Again, because the waste dump is too close to the playground, right? Um, uh, operative wounds and the most common of all urinary tract infections. Incredibly common, especially women who have Foley catheters during labor. Very high risk of urinary tract infection. It's very common to come back two weeks postpartum with a UTI and, uh, you know, we just give them some antibiotics and it's fine. Another one that's mentioned is mastitis. It's a complication of breastfeeding. You, we talked about that last week briefly, right? And it's on your slides. But skin breakdown plus baby saliva uh, leads women to more complications with mastitis. And it usually happens more than eight weeks postpartum. And what's important is just to recognize that women who are you know, postpartum and not acting normal might have an infection. So you see something unusual, you have to go, well, could this be an infection? Does she have an elevated pulse and a fever? Does she have pain? You know, is there redness or something? Does she have a source for infection? We should look into that, okay? Uh, and, and again, treat it with antibiotics, rest, fluids, comfort <coughs> measures. Postpartum blues, we talked about that. Postpartum depression, we talked about that. The important difference between blues and postpartum is that blues are self-limiting. Depression is not. It continues on and on and on, okay? You want to identify people who are at risk for postpartum depression? People who are socially isolated. Not stay-at-home mothers, but socially isolated, okay? The woman who killed her, her children in Texas uh, 10 years or so ago, Pamela or something, or I can't remember her name, but she was socially isolated. There was a little bit of an abuse situation there. She had... Her husband did not allow her to have any friends and, you know, just kept getting her pregnant and there was more to it than she just went crazy one day. She was, she was in an abusive relationship and she was socially isolated from the world. That one, low, low, low income, low resource folks, folks who are, are, are unable to cope with daily living in a normal world, now put into a stressful situation and more likely to have postpartum depression, okay? People who were once someone big and important 
who are now not. That's another big one. Um, I have a patient that I'm taking care of. She's postpartum. She's about a year out, but she used to be, the, she used to manage all helicopters uh, for Fort Bragg. You know, she was a big woman, paid lots of money, married to a colonel, E6, and life was wonderful. She got pregnant, now she's a stay-at-home mom, and she can't do anything she used to do. And she doesn't want to do anything, but the fact that she's no longer that important person responsible for millions of dollars of equipment bothers her. And so she became severely postpartum, uh, severely depressed postpartum. She's not transitioning to, to valuing motherhood like, she, like, like we would like her to. Okay? Yeah, they can. They, get, they resent being a mother, yeah. And then there's postpartum psychosis. Postpartum psychosis usually happens in the first eight weeks postpartum, and then mom has a break with reality. She literally becomes psychotic um, to the point where she's having hallucinations, she's having confusion, she's having um, fantasies of killing her baby. I've seen it three or four times, and every single one of them wanted to stab their baby with a fork. I don't know why it was stabbing with a fork, but that was the, the way they wanted to kill their baby. And there are women who say, I can't go in the kitchen because there's forks in there, and I'm afraid of what will happen if I touch a fork. I mean, bad. I mean, break with reality. And um, what's important is to recognize that this is not postpartum depression. Okay? When someone's having suicidal or homicidal thoughts, you have moved beyond depression. Okay? And uh, they, they lose touch with reality and you need to hospitalize them until they're no longer dangerous. And understand, they're not in trouble. A lot of people, they're going to take my baby away if they have to hospitalize me. No, we just want to separate mom and baby until mom is capable of taking care of baby again. That's all. And so we admit mom for a couple of days and get her started on lots of wonderful medications and encourage her to come back to taking care of her baby. Okay? Um, it's important to understand that women who are postpartum are vulnerable, okay? They're vulnerable to you, they're vulnerable to their husbands, they're vulnerable to society. This is a very vulnerable time being postpartum. It's why we do such horrible things to postpartum women and they don't even recognize it. You know, like, you know, the, the whole, you know, uh, 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 putting their baby in the nursery and not letting her hold her baby for 24 hours or that kind of thing. That's not what we would do to normal people. But postpartum women are vulnerable, they don't know what's what's right and wrong oftentimes they're not able to stand up for themselves okay and uh, uh, so they're vulnerable to us they're vulnerable to their husbands they're vulnerable to other people they're vulnerable to employers and it's important to understand to teach women you are you have value there's something wonderful going on and you need to be supported and loved and taken care of and nobody should take advantage of you and if you feel like someone's taking advantage of you they probably are you don't deserve it Okay, a lot of women think that this is just normal, that they deserve it, this is part of motherhood, and that's not it, okay? So being, part of being a patient advocate is paying attention to that kind of stuff. All right. Hey, I made it all the way through. It's good stuff. Now we can talk about the, the, the drug calculation drug calculations test. You guys saw, you guys have this, right? Yes. yes. It was given to you, I think it was given to you again over the summer, okay? And in it, it has the rules. You must score above 80. You come to the test with a pencil and nothing else, right? Um, you have to know the dosage calculations and rounding rules, right? If there's three, if it's less than zero and three, did you calculate down to three digits and round to the second place, right? To the hundredth. If it's over one, you calculate out to the second digit and round it to the one. So it's uh, 0 0.235 would be 0 0.24, right? And 1.673 would be 1.7, right? Because, it, it, but it's here. Um, when you're converting to pounds and kilograms, make sure that you go to the tenth pound, or to the tenth, right? So it's 64.4, not 64.4763, just 64.4, right? Drip rates, you want to round to the nearest whole number. Don't give me 42 and a half drops per minute, or <laughs> give me 43, all right? Same thing with pills. You round to the nearest half a pill. One pill, one and a half pill, two pills, okay? Not one and three quarters pills, right? So you round it to the nearest half when you're talking about pills. So and then there are sample problems in here I thought are important. And then there's a couple of sample tests. Now, I started writing the test today. I promise you, 
I am going to use only OBGYN medication. Magnesium, okay. Ancef, Gentamicin, Ampicillin, uh, Methogen, but it doesn't matter. The name of the drug is irrelevant. I could call it drug Obical all the way through, and it wouldn't matter. The drug is 100% irrelevant. The only thing we're focusing is on calculations, changing pounds into kilograms, multiplying kilograms per milligrams per kilogram. How many, you know, if you're going to run methotrexate for 24 hours and you need to give her 676 milligrams of methotrexate, how many cc's per hour are you going to have to run it? There will be a concentration. This many, so, see, this many milligrams in this many cc's. I want to say it's one gram per liter is what I'm using. So one gram per liter and then how many cc's per hour are you going to run on your methotrexate? Okay. The, uh, uh, I'm playing around having fun with it, so I'm using like 5-FU, uh, which is a, a chemotherapy drug, and cisplatin and that kind of stuff. And I'm using actual doses just because I think it's fun to kind of practice for myself. So if I ever wanted to treat someone who had cancer, I would know how to do it. Like I could ever do that, right? But I'm playing around with that. So I'm using real drugs, but the drug names are 100% irrelevant. You need to know how to calculate drip rates. Um, meaning how to set your pump, like I was shocked when we were doing our, uh, our postpartum, I mean our, um, our preeclampsia drills, and it was give her a bolus of 20 cc's, you know, or give her, give her 100 cc's in 20 minutes, people were like, how many cc's per hour is that? Okay, you need to know that stuff, that if you want to give 100 cc's in 20 minutes, you set your pump to 300 cc's an hour. That kind of stuff needs to just roll off the top of your head. Okay, and, that, and so that's what the, this is all about, is practicing your drug calculations over and over and over again until they make sense. I haven't the foggiest idea what a grain is. I'm not going to ask any questions about a grain. Did nobody, you read the problem? No, I didn't. Oh, okay. nobody, nobody uses grains. I don't even know what they are. <laughs> Definitely not an obstetric. So they're all going to be obstetric drugs, and they're all going to be obstetric situations. Doses, you know... How many pills for Cytotec, and how many uh, how many um, how many pills do you need if you're going to put them on a relactation protocol? You know that kind of stuff. Okay, stuff that you might see if you work in OBGYN world. Right? Does anybody need help figuring out their drug calculations? What's that? Hmm? I thought a gram was like 60 milligrams. Mm hmm. Don't get me lying. <laughs> Did you ever get an answer to that um, question you were doing the other day? Which one? The one on Facebook. The one on Facebook. Uh, where it was where you said it was 1.67. Oh, oh, yeah, they said the score was 1.25. It was 1 that you wanted to give the same drug, but just space it out more. That was the answer. I said, she's wrong. And uh, I said, what does that person do for a living? Do they take care of sick people or not? And they said, she's a veterinarian. I said, she's wrong. <laughs> just ignore her. Answer the question and move on. She may be a wonderful pharmacology professor, but that's not how you would use ANSEF. It's okay. <laughs> but yeah, so I was like, you know, if she's a critical care nurse practitioner, okay, I'll bow to her. That's fine. She knows more about it. But she's a veterinarian? She know. Yeah, so <laughs> definitely doesn't know how to take care of pregnant women. So this is next class? Or yeah, next today? class. So next week we're off. The week after that, we're in class. We're doing a drug test. Okay. Now, the next week is the next test, right? October twenty seventh yeah. is the next test, and it's going to be breastfeeding. It's going to be postpartum. It's going to be the rest of high risk. Remember all the stuff I said. Do not study these things. Right. Time to study those things. Okay. So it's going to be the rest of high risk. It's going to be breastfeeding. It's going to be postpartum. It's going to be neonatal transition to extrauterine life and basic neonatal care. Okay. So. Over this, uh, over this, you know, break. Take a little break, but do understand transition to extra uterine life. I love that topic. Okay, we're going to talk about it a lot in two weeks, and it's going to be on your test. Okay. Um, what else is important? Um, papers. Papers are coming due. You should have already turned in your rough draft to somebody else for them to read it. If you haven't, you're behind the power curve. I'm not going to quiz you on it, but know that I know if you haven't had someone else read it, because it's filled with all kinds of foolish errors that you wouldn't normally make. 
Because when someone else reads it, when you look at it, it always looks perfect, right? right. So you need to get someone else to read it. I highly recommend taking some of that $40,000 you pay for tuition and using the writing center. Mm -hmm. They're amazing. Okay? Good. Go see them and let them read your paper and do all that professional stuff for you to take good care of you. Um, what else is important? Uh, but do, 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 please, please, don't make me reject papers again. That is such a pain in the butt. I hate doing it. Okay, I don't enjoy it. It is so much work. It is so much work. Hours and hours and hours spent reading it. It is so wonderful when I read a paper and it's just perfect. And I'm like, oh. Maybe. 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 <laughs> but, uh, but please, spend some time on your papers. A lot of you have come and talked to me about what your topic is and where can I help, and I feel like I've been pretty helpful. If you need more help, please come to me. I want to help. I want, to make, I want you guys to get something out of writing these papers. Okay? They're there not just because I feel like I, you know, because I like to torture people with papers. They're there because, A, I want to teach you how to write. And B, I want you to pick a topic of interest and get really good at it. Okay, learn an awful lot about something. Okay? You can change our topic, right? You can change whatever you want anytime. I have no control over that. Do whatever you gotta do. Never tell an artist what to paint. They'll paint whatever they want. Right? You can use words to paint a picture. No, not gonna happen. I cannot write. Oh, it's so easy to write a paper. I wrote three papers this weekend. I wrote a paper on um, on how to manage uh, or do you need to pump and dump after getting a deep tissue massage? I put six references in it and it was two pages long. I posted it on the internet just for fun. Yeah. You better not say yes after you said you could drink a beer while you. Uh... Yeah. If you guys you guys know I have a breastfeeding advice page called Sage Hump. And so, uh, uh, on that page, you'll find all my essays that I write. What? Sage Hom, H-O-M-M-E. -M -M -E. It's a play on words. The word, the French word for midwife is Sage Femme. But since I'm a man, I can't be Sage Femme. So I'm Sage Hom, which is the French word for man. No, no, that, that's called mental illness. That is a body dysmorphic disorder. Dr. 